All right, chemistry lab videos, titration labs. Now, titration lab is something that we use a lot in chemistry. Um, they also is probably one of the number one questions, uh, lab questions especially, on the AP exam that they're going to ask. So you need to know about titrations, and we'll get more and more on this when we get later on in the year into acid bases. But we usually always do a titration lab at the start of the year. One of the things that you need to know is that when we do a titration, what we're doing is we're taking the concentration of a known substance, and we're trying to determine what the concentration of the unknown substance is, okay? And when we reach what's known as the equivalence point, that means that it is an equal amount of one to the other. So, normally the first one you're going to do is using an unknown acid with a known base, okay? And the base um, is usually something we call standardized. That means it has been tested to know exactly what its concentration is. And in the acid, you will be tested, you have three different uh, acids, and you'll be testing to try to determine what their concentration is. Now over here, as you can see, or once I change my pen here, okay, over here you can see you have a pH probe, which you will be using in the lab. And the pH probe will hook up to the uh, uh, LabQuest 2, and will allow you to see the changes right on the screen because it will have a, uh, a, a like a, t a graph right there that you'll be able to see as you're dropping your your solution of your known which will be in your burette so this is where your known base is going to be in this first lab anyways and down here is going to be our unknown acid okay and when we get to the point, if you remember, okay, and if you don't, make sure you review, an acid is something that has lots of extra hydrogen ions, and a base is something that has lots of extra hydroxide ions. And when these two equal, we are at what's called the EQ, or the equivalence point. The concentration of this is the concentration of this, okay? Now, Here's a typical setup of what you'll use. You'll use a single jaw burette clamp and our ring stand, which is in your lab drawer. And then you'll use our 50 milliliter burettes. Now, sometimes the burette clamp won't clamp really tight right here. So if that's the case, you need to take a paper towel and wrap around the burette. Okay put some paper towel in this area here, wrap it around the burette inside the clamp so when you clamp down the clamp it's nice and tight because right here is the critical point of the burette and that's the tip and if this slips down and you crack the tip or chip the tip then you're going to buy the entire burette because we can't fix that and that's uh, they're about $75 a piece because they're very accurate so make sure that you test it and this is where you're going to fill up your base. So the first thing you're going to do is when you get your system set up is you're going to put some DH2O, some, you know, distilled or deionized water into the burette. And you're going to run it down into a waste beaker, okay? That makes sure that the tip and everything is working and when you turn this stopcock here it will actually work and not continue to drip if you have any problems you gotta let me know so we can get that fixed now once we get that done then we're going to be adding in a base and you want to fill your base in here which will be you know standardized base and we put base in here and we fill it up above the zero mark and then we drain it down to where we're right here at the top and that way we make sure we drain some through into our waste beaker 
And then we know that we've got everything loaded because this 0 to 50 right here, that is to this point. So when you start to drop down and you go 0, 1, 2, 3, you know, 5 milliliters or whatever we put in there, then that's because it counted it from this tip. So you have to make sure the tip's loaded. And that is a trick question that I have seen on the AP exam. Okay. Now, when reading the amount of volume that you're actually looking at, that's where this picture over here comes in. And what we're going to read is what's called the meniscus. And that's where you see because of the um, water properties of adhesive and cohesiveness of water, it will crawl up the sides of glassware. The thinner the glassware, the bigger this loop is. You read at the bottom of the meniscus, not how high it goes up on the sides. You're reading at the very bottom of that loop right there, and that's what you would use to read. Many times you can take a piece of white paper in a small square and place this white paper behind your burette so you can see the line and read it much, much easier. But this is what you want to do to get your system set up, okay? And this is how we would read it. Remember, the known base goes into the burette. The unknown acid goes into a clean beaker, not our waste beaker, a clean beaker down at the bottom. Now, we use indicators. I will put several of them on the back table. You have to then kind of determine where do I think I'm going to need my indicator. Remember, an indicator changes color depending on the pH. So if I had something that I knew was a strong acid plus a strong base, then I know that I'm going to end up somewhere in the middle. You want to review the pH video if you haven't seen it, but I'm going to end up in the middle of my pH and the middle of pH is around 7, okay? So if I knew I had a strong acid and a strong base, and you're using a strong base, and if you know that anything that's hydrochloric, hydrofluoric, any of that nature, those are strong acids, okay? So that means I'm going to have something that's going to be around 7. And I want an indicator that's going to change color around 7. Now that would mean I could use bromothymol blue, Okay, because if I start with my base, okay, my P, excuse me, if I start with my acid in my unknown, and that's where my pH probe's going to be, then my pH probe's going to be reading somewhere in this area here. And then as I add base, it's going to increase this way. So I want something that I see here is going to be yellow when it's acid. It's going to be blue when it is actually now base, and when it's right at my 7, I can see just as it starts to change, I know that I've got to be close to my equivalence point, okay, my EQ point. So if you're using then a weak acid and a strong base, then I know that when I get to my equivalence point, my pH value is going to be somewhere up in here. Okay, so that's why you'll see that normally we call for using phenolphthalein, which is clear up until it gets pink. Now here's some indicators of phenolphthalein, and this is what I'm talking about. When you're looking to get to that EQ point, okay, that means you've got this plus this is now equal. Doesn't mean it's the same concentration. It means I've got the same number of hydrogen ions in there as I do hydroxide ions, okay? That's all it means. Now, phenolphthalein changes color at around 8. This here, if I was using a strong acid and a strong base, okay, then I know my pH is going to be around 7. So this here is probably a little over 7. Being since it turns color, 
when it's up here in 8. This is probably about a 7.4 into there. This here is below, you know, somewhere around 7 because it's still clear. Up here, I am now way past the transfer point on my phenolphthalein indicator, and what that's going to show is that I am now over, and I'm probably up around 8.0 because I've changed color. When it just starts to turn pink, that's when I want to stop, and I read the amount of base that I have put into because that volume of base is what I'm going to be looking for, okay? That's why it shows right down here. Good endpoint. And this is way too far. Here's what we're talking about. If I have a strong acid, strong base, this here shows because my pH probe starts off in an acid because I'm way down here in a pH of 1 or 2. So I'm going along and I'm adding base and I'm adding base. I'm adding my sodium hydroxide, adding base. I'm getting higher and higher and higher. And when I get to the point that all of a sudden there is a huge jump, you will never see this point. This point is calculated. It is determined by you. You're going to see this point here. And you're going to see this point here. You're going to go, holy mackerel, now all of a sudden I'm way up in here and we're going this way. That means that you needed to look at this point, what was the volume here, and what was the volume here. And that volume that's in between those two areas right there, that is my EQ point, okay? That is the exact volume that I want to use in my formula because we're going to use remember the molarity times the volume of one will equal the molarity times the volume of a second one okay so we're looking for we have a known molarity of one so if this is my acid and this is my base I'm going to try to determine how much volume I am dropping down out of my burette into my unknown acid beaker. My molarity, I know, of my base. I do not know the molarity of this, but I do know how much volume, and usually it's around 25 milliliters or whatever we have here. Okay, So, this is the formula that we use on our acid-base titrations. As you can see, this would be like looking at your screen of your LabQuest 2 with your pH probe. Here I have a fairly, still have sodium hydroxide, and here's my unknown acid over here. But this took a lot more volume to get over here, but from right here's my end point in this little area right here. And that's all you're looking for, is at what point did I have my biggest change? you know, that's going on from that point to that point. That's what you're looking for when you're trying to determine where your endpoint is. Don't worry about these. We will talk about the K subvalues and the PKAs when we get later on into acids and bases. So, most problems kids have in lab is that when you're doing a titration, and maybe I give you two or three unknown acids to titrate, well, you're supposed to do everything three times. You can do it two times if you come up with the exact same number. But if you do a titration and come up with this concentration, then do it again and you come up with a different concentration, you have to do it three times. So if you have to do everything two to three times, and you have three unknowns, that's a minimum of six titrations up to nine titrations. You have to be able to do them fast. Otherwise, you're going to be coming in on your own time to get the lab done and to get your lab report complete. Here are some tricks to running fast titrations. Number one, you fill the, bar, the, the burette, your 50 milliliter burette, you fill that up with your known solution. Okay? That's called the titrant. Now, you're going to take, if they tell you to take 25, maybe it's 50, it doesn't matter, it depends on what the lab 
procedure say? Maybe you're using 25 milliliters of your acid, okay? So you pour that into your beaker. Then you go to your lab table. By the way, the unknown part that we're analyzing is called the analyte, okay? You go to your beaker, and what you're going to do is you're going to take one half, okay? One half of that unknown solution you're going to take, and you're going to pour it into a separate beaker and set it aside, okay? So maybe we're only going to use 12.5 of it, okay? Now, if your pH probe will not sit down below the level of the water because you use too large a beaker, then add water. Add 25 milliliters of water. It's not going to change the concentration of the hydrogen or the hydroxide ions that are in there, okay? So now, I've only got half of my unknown, and I'm going to titrate. I've got my indicator in there, depending on which one I go, and now I'm just going to dump large amounts because your, your procedure is going to tell you just change until you get about, you know, 0.1 or 0.3 on the pH and little tiny bits at a time. Too slow. So you're going to take your burette and you're just going to open it up, open it up into your beaker down here, until this thing changes. Boom. I got my color change. I'm now past my point. Don't fret because now you know that you're pretty close. You take that half that you set aside and you dump it down into here. Add that to there and now you can go slower and see where you're actually at because maybe you started you know up here and we ran it all the way down here just to get the first half. Now you can go slower and then figure out where you're at. Somebody should be you know filling up the next beaker with unknown acid. Somebody should have their burette filled and remember if you put in 50 milliliters of your known base in a burette and you drain it down to get the one as long as you know that hey this one here took 25 milliliters I got another 25 you could ru probably run another one without having to change anything you know smaller than that you can definitely run two titrations without having to refill your burette each and every time okay so this is a trick to get it done a little faster you should be able to run, if you know what you're doing and you're well prepared, three titrations in one 50-minute lab period if you know what you're doing. I usually give you two lab periods to do the six lab, the six titrations. As always, the biggest thing to do is to read the lab procedures, okay? Otherwise, the element of surprise is going to come up and enter into your lab and you're going to be spending lots more time in the lab to get this done than you need to. If you have any questions after reading the lab handout and watching this video, be sure to bring them in, okay? I have not set the lab uh, error on this one yet. We may just be doing this to you know, see how it's uh, going to work, but if not, I'll let you know during lab time. As always, Stay gritty out there.